Hi, I'm Shlomi Ron. I'm the CEO of the Visual Storytelling Institute. Uh, we are based here in uh, sunny Miami, Florida. And we're all about uh, spreading the gospel of visual storytelling from the world of art into marketing. And uh, what we do is uh, pretty much uh, helping brands uh, tell better stories through visual storytelling consulting, training, and thought leadership, like this show you're in right now. <laughs> so one of the focus uh, in my latest uh, podcast have been uh, the metaverse, if you recall. The first one was all about uh, NFT, and uh, we talked about, uh, you know, the, with the co-founder of the uh, Upland. Then we moved to how to manage virtual assets talk from an estate planning. There's lots of great uh, millionaires in the space. And today I want to focus on a different angle. So we all know that NFT started back in last spring, then the metaverse kind of broke out uh, on October. And another piece of the puzzle is very interesting development. It's called DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And this is a new way to organize and mobilize audiences that really kind of go well above and beyond, you know, the loyalty club or, you know, these uh, Kickstarter or Patreon uh, communities that uh, have been formed in recent years. So to help me out, uh, deep dive, to kind of dig deeper into this uh, exciting topic, I invited uh, Jeremy uh, Gilbertson. He's a metaverse expert. And recently I came across an interesting article he wrote uh, for Variety, where he really kind of uh, dissect uh, the whole, uh, this new brave world of DAOs. So with that, welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm definitely excited to talk about it. It's a topic I've uh, I've been researching a lot for, you know, over a year and, and really digging into the possibilities and, and kind of, mm -hmm. like you said, spreading the gospel a bit of, the, of what you can do with something like that. Yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. So before we jump right in, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your backstory, because I know you told me just before we got started, you know, that you're covering so many bases. You're pretty much a renaissance man. <laughs> Well, it's it's very kind of you to say that. Uh, I um I, I'm into a lot of different things. So I've been at the intersection of of music, technology, and brand for the last 20 years. I um was I started out in the data center space. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, I built a um uh a consulting arm within a larger consulting organization that focused on data center strategy oh, transformation. So basically, you know, where you put your yeah. network compute storage, disaster recovery, that kind of stuff. Got it. While I was doing that. I also uh, started a music production company that was doing music for advertising. Then we moved into film and TV and immersive experiences and that sort of thing. So I spent a lot of time in that world. And then I moved into uh, kind of merging consulting and music together. I met a guy named Joe Belliotti, who's mm -hmm. currently the CEO of Massive Music. He yeah. was former head of global music for Coca-Cola. So right. he and I got together and created an organization called the Music Division, where mm -hmm. we were essentially outsourced um, chief music officers, for lack of a better term, where we would help brands uh, activate and, and partner with music really authentically in a way to grow audience and grow reach and that sort of thing. So Interesting. I did that for a while. And then uh, lastly, I, you know, I got pulled into to the Web3 rabbit hole about, you know, 12 or 18 months ago, starting with a text from a good friend of mine. What is a, you know, if you don't know what an NFT is, you know, yeah. spend some time <laughs> researching it. And, you know, Shlomi, like, like you probably have friends that, you know, if you get texts from, there are certain ones that you look at a little closer and spend yeah. a little more time on. So I did. And kind of the rest is history with, uh, with blockchain and, and NFTs and um, metaverse, Web3, yeah. DAOs. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really like, you know, the, the Wild West right now, there's so many opportunities and a lot of people have so many questions and especially marketers, visual storytellers that really need to kind of uh, keep up on the latest, you know, where the attention is always uh, flowing into. And, you know, this is what I always keep telling my clients and students, you know, you always want to pay attention to what's the uh, for the latest innovations, because it's important to kind of uh, uh, put a leg and experiment uh, as long as your strategy support it. So before we, you know, get to really the depth of, you know, uh, DAOs, maybe can you just in very simple plain terms, just explain what is a DAO? 
Yeah, well, as you said, um, you know, decentralized autonomous organization, it's, it's a way to catalyze and activate a community around a common mission using, yep. uh, using blockchain technology. Um, you know, a lot of people struggle with the idea of them because they think they're this, you know, leaderless ship, right? right? That, yep. that, you know, how can a, how can a, community drive all of this you know with automation and and, and it's a bit of a spectrum approach to leadership right because mm. when you start a DAO there's usually a really tight-knit community that pulls together the the philosophy the white paper the why the philosophical right. constructs of why they're getting together and what the miss mission is and where they're pointing towards um so there's a lot of tight-knit you know collaboration and development there but then as the rules get set, as the governance gets set and you move into the community mm -hmm. starting to bring what I call their superpowers to the table, right. right? So if you picture each member of the community, you know, with a circle around them and their, their superpower stated, right? They can provide that superpower to the community in return for some kind of, uh, some, you know, whether it's a token or whether it's, you know, some I other see. kind of uh, return. Um, but I think the biggest thing to think about is having that having that spectrum based leadership, right? Because, you know, you don't start right off the bat and everything is run by computers. You got to set, everything's philosophy driven, I think. I see, I see. So if, for example, you know, a brand is interested in a, starting a, a DAO for, I mean, we typically used to call them a loyalty clubs or, you know, ambassador clubs that brands uh, would manage. Uh, how how would they start this? I mean, what are what is the process? Uh, you, there's obviously some founding team, you know, the people that have the idea and need to actually start drafting the the rules in a smart contract. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, brands are interesting um, in that you know the way a brand is developed, it's a bit like a DAO, right? It's like right. you have assets, you have a you have a, a company that the brand mm -hmm. is is like this ethereal vehicle for, right? Sure. But a brand emerges over time, right? A brand yeah. is not all of a sudden, hey, I've got my logo. Here's my brand. Here we go. It's like this, right. this emerging quality. So if brands think about DAOs as they think about how their brand develops over time and how close they want their community to come into that, what really gets interesting is co-creation, I think, for DAOs. Mm -hmm. Um, it allows the ability, if the brands are willing, to to participate in the development of the brand. I mean, it sounds right. super scary to a to a chief marketing officer. Like, I'm not going to let someone create my logo or like do something like that. But audience feeds brand almost as much as the the visual identity system. Although um, you, you just see user generated content has been done for many campaigns. Uh, but to your point, this is a much more structured and more monetized way from the perspective of the members, right? Yeah, absolutely. One one instance I ran across a while back was a, a company called Metaversal. That is a kind of their part um, part. I think they part investment fund to invest in NFT projects, right. part NFT creation studio, and they released uh, Meta Letters DAO recently. And I thought it was really fascinating what they did. They actually like opened up their visual identity mm -hmm. system uh, via a Creative Commons CC0 license, right. which basically allowed people to take their bits and pieces and, and tweak them and, and contribute to them. And that was the first point. I was like, wow, that's really amazing that a, <laughs> that a brand would do that, right? So um, they were, they were, they basically walked the walk, you know, Meta Letters DAO, their visual identity was created by the members of the DAO. Like, uh, I thought, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Cause this is the ultimate uh, customer voice, right? <laughs> right. It's, and that's right. coming from the C-suite. It's actually people participating and creating this, uh, uh, visual art. Uh, and there, and there are levels you could set to the contribution mm -hmm. and parameters you can set, like the amount of uh, interaction you want to have people playing with these brand assets, right? right. Um, that that make you comfortable, but let people come in close enough, right? To to feel like I they're see. part of something. I see. Yeah, and, and, and one thing that also kind of uh, confusing in my mind. I mean, until recently, there was also some marketers and brands were uh, using social tokens like uh, practices with Rally.io, for example. 
uh, to mobilize their audience. How is that different from a DAO? <laughs> Yeah, social tokens are, are are a little bit different, I think, than mm -hmm. than DAOs. I mean, all of them are kind of community driven, right? But with with most social tokens, I think the difference you hold a social token because you believe in the artist behind it, right? Let's right. just say simply, it's like an artist or creator. You believe in that artist yeah. or creator behind it, but more often than not, you don't have um, voting the rights. To yeah, voting rights. You that you I don't see. that artist is not going to let you decide what they draw next. Oh, right? I They're see. not going to let you decide what what kind of music they make next. But right. in a DAO, you could propose and say, "Hey, you know, uh, Shlomi, I want you to make this kind of record coming up, and here's why I think you should do that." And then the community can all say, "Hey, that's a great idea," or they could say, "No, that's not a great idea." But you might have as the artist more voting rights or voting power to kind of say, Hey, I've got ultimate creative control. Thanks for the feedback guys. I see. You can set all kinds of what, here's an interesting, I've been, I've been talking a lot, but I want to share this. I, I was just on a call with a, uh, my buddy, who's a tokenomics expert, just a wizard, um, uh -huh. you know, computer science, right. It's mathematician, <laughs> like all of this kind of stuff. And these are the these are the people that power the back end of DAOs, which are super important. So you got to have the philosophical yeah. component, and then also the computer science engineering tokenomics aspect of it. Right. And he referred to he referred to that tooling as like a synthesizer for data, mm. right? That you can actually control and 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 decide as you're seeing the reactions of what's coming out of decision making and voting and all of that. You can turn the knobs and try different things. So I thought that was an interesting way to look at it. Interesting. Yeah. So if I understand what you're saying, you know, the difference with social tokens, it, it's still a very centralized and the tokens are really used as an incentive for the members, but uh, there is still one a decision maker, which is the artist or the, the founder of that uh, uh, community versus DAO where it's, it's more, uh, you know, there is a founding team that set the rules, but then, you know, the whole uh, decision-making process is, is done by the members and uh, in order to become a member, you need to purchase a token. I think that's the, the only similarity, I guess, that you need to be, uh, that's how you get to earn the voting rights, right? Yeah, and I think anything can kind of be structured for, for most of these projects. I know, you mm. know, we're, we talked earlier, it's kind of wild westy a little yeah. bit, but, um, <laughs> you know, back, back in the day, like one of the first social tokens, I think that came out a while back was Portugal the Man, the band right. had a the PTM token, right? And it was yep. the idea was to instead of paying ten bucks a month to get access to unique content and yep. you know that sort of thing, you actually buy something as this token, hoping that the band's going to do cooler stuff right. over time, and you could sell that position in yep. that versus you know where you're just paying money away. So that's the social token construct in my mind, and the DAO takes it one step further where you have position in that, but you could also propose what that entity does and participate in voting on right. you know, what other people think it should do. Right. Before we, we kind of switch to examples, I'm, I'm still kind of wondering as a voting machine, you know, you have a community with hundred members and let's pick a brand, you know, that is actually a mobilizing them. Couldn't be any conflict from the brand perspective, you know, that, you know, the majority of members are steering the this, this ship to maybe a direction the brand is not interested. What, what do you do then? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think it all starts with, um, it all starts with doing the upfront work mm -hmm. with your philosophy, your white paper, your governance, your voting mechanics to really spend the time there to make sure um, to, to de-risk that a little bit. I mean, you can't, you know, 100% de-risk it, but then once right. you have that in place, you look at the different voting mechanics, right? There's, there's conviction voting, which, uh, you know, which you hold your position in a vote. It's a voting period that's open and longer. I see. Um, there's quadratic voting, which is a little bit different where, you know, you have a certain set of tokens and you can vote with, um, you know, you can give one initiative, one token and another initiative, five tokens, because you mm, believe in that I initiative see. more than you believe in the front one. So I the see. voting mechanics have been around for a long time. I mean, we've been right. organizing as a society in multiple ways for a long time, and we've been making decisions collectively for a long time, but now we're able to apply the, the mathematics 
uh, the tokenomics and the blockchain structure to it to, to, Got to it. do different things with it. Got it. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, different types of DAOs that you see in the market right now that uh, are really successful and maybe some lessons for brands? Well, there, yeah, there, there, you know, one example of a DAO is, is kind of people coming together to acquire something, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Whether it's a golf course or the U.S. Constitution, believe it or not, there were DAOs related yeah. to both of those. <laughs> uh, Constitution DAO is really interesting in that they mobilized that large amount of, of community, that large amount of capital in, you know, a very short amount of time. And they didn't actually end up uh, winning the auction for the constitution, yeah. but like in what other world could you organize that amount of people, that amount of money and direct them straight towards a mission where everyone's aligned? I mean, that's a pretty, it's incredible pretty interesting mechanic, right? Yeah, of course. And, and do you, you know, probably see the marketing muscle that you need to put in in order to recruit members even to do that, right? It doesn't have, have <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. You so it all still everything boil to me boils down. You got to pull the pull on the thread a little bit and get back to the first principles mm -hmm. of all of this stuff. And the first principles are, you know, the 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 philosophy, the community building, and how you build that community over time, right? Because there's there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of noise in the space, not just DAOs, but Web three in general, where right. you have people you know, doing things that aren't necessarily the right thing. And, you know, they're the rug pulls and that sort of thing. So building a community authentically mm -hmm. is, is one of the key things. And, and I was talking to a group the other day, it wasn't necessarily DAO related, but this was more a blockchain gaming, like a play to earn. Yep. And we were trying to help them figure out how long the ramp prior to their NFT drop should be, because, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of people are like, well, Hey, I've got the NFT Let's yeah. push it out there and see what happens. And it's like, no way. You yeah. got it. Like you got to generate interest um, yeah. and, and really see the community and pull people in. And then what, what doing that early can really do is, you know, DAOs are this bottom up mechanic, right? We're not really this hierarchy top down, but it allows, right. as you build a community, you can see the people that are really engaged in it and people that really believe in it. And then you can elevate those people to hire in better positions and have this upward mobility mechanic built into it. And then the community it is like a self-sustaining thing, as opposed to someone at the top going, this is what we got to do guys, you know? Right. Um, so I think yeah, that's that makes pretty, sense. pretty compelling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you look at these uh, DAOs that you consult with, and one thing that I'm also <laughs> interested kind of reading about it is, you know, for example, I read about dirt, which is a newsletter on Substack that uh, has about 6,000 members and they decide not to charge them the paid membership. And instead they give them this opportunity to buy an NFT and, and become part of the community and, and create that, that DAO this way, which is kind of interesting as well. So in terms of uh, the function the members have, you know, obviously you mentioned they buy a, the, the DAO token in order to earn the, the voting power. But I read also that sometimes they have a functional roles, like if it's a community of creatives, like the communities that you come from, uh, some of them can be videographer, other could be, you know, copywriter. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's the coolest part about it to me, because a lot of, it, what, what, I, what I don't like to see is you know this this situation where you know in order to get in the DAO you have to bring a, a stack of cash right to participate in it right there I love the projects that basically say hey do you believe in the mission you know mm -hmm. let's talk about how there's an application process and all of that and maybe you got to get recommended by by somebody or or that sort of thing but you know the idea of like remember drawing a circle around the superpower just like you draw a digital border around an NFT you draw around the superpower and then you figure out how you monetize or how you, uh, how you incentivize different superpowers at work. So again, it goes back to the governance model on the front end, right. spend the time on the front end and then it just kind of rolls. And I love those projects. It, it it's almost goes back to, we used to, we used to like have a term for it back in uh, the early music days when I was, when I was starting tune welders, the music production company, we mm -hmm. always called it the bro deal 
where, <laughs> um, you know, we had, we would have a friend that was working on a project that didn't have any budget and right. they needed studio space. And we're like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll come in and, and, you know, come into our spot. We'll record you, we'll right. handle it all. And then like three weeks later, we'll be working on a commercial project that needs an awesome drummer. And I there was see. this, you know, this un understood um, capture of value right. back and forth feeding the system. But um, I think that to me, that's what's really compelling about this, this way to bring people together. Yeah, and I know this is really important point. So people need to understand the DAOs are not only based on the, you know, monetary uh, contribution to the to the community in order to participate. You can also, I mean, the value exchange could also extend to your talent, your superpower, as you put it. And if you have a specific talent you want to bring to the community and the community really looking for that talent in order to build that uh, project that's part of the mission, then you know, that's another way to start it down, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But still, at the end of the day, all of those collected superpowers, whatever they're pointing towards has to drive value, right? Val to make yeah. it all trickle down and work for right. everybody. So right. um, it's one of those things where you have to kind of, you almost have to bet on the right group, right? Or, or, um, or uh, you know, sometimes you you just take a chance for something you believe in and and a lot of times you know things that i've done over the time you know work that i've done for free because mm -hmm. i believed in a project and i was like you know if we get paid for this great if not great right. um but either way i've learned something coming out of that right exactly um but the financial mechanism obviously you know mm -hmm. is is the way kind of the world works we got to have food we got to have shelter we got to yep. do that kind of thing too so you can right. only you can only do that stuff so much i think yeah, no, that's that's important. I think also that uh, something that uh, I read in another article is that uh, it's really important to uh, know also also the legal, the tax implication of starting a DAO, which is still kind of uh, in a fuzzy area, right? <laughs> it, it is absolutely, and and that is that is one side of it that I am not an expert in, but I do right. have friends that I rely on for a lot mm. of that stuff. Um, like the tokenomics I expert I was on the phone with before. Um, one of the in most interesting ways I've heard this addressed was um, through a guy named Ian Lee. And Ian mm -hmm. Lee is one of the founders of Syndicate DAO. Right. Um, and they're basically like a DAO uh, startup uh, mm -hmm. tool. Like DAO, they call it DAO tooling that you know, allows you to set up a treasury, set up the governance, all of I that see. kind of stuff, right? So he, the way they launched it was through, um, they call it Web3 Investment Clubs. Mm. And what he, what he was telling me, and you guys can check all of this out on, on yeah. Syndicate DAO, <clears throat> um, but um, Ian was telling me that uh, the investment club rules point to uh, as long as there, I think there are five or six parameters. One is like, mm -hmm. has to be under a hundred members. The other one has to be all all of I those see. members have to have a say or a vote in whatever the treasury does. And there are five or six different parameters that he right. outlines that, and these are based on the investment clubs that were around in like the 1800s. Oh, like wow. when people physically got together to put the investment club uh, together and invested in things and that sort of thing. So syndicate had a really interesting answer um, answer to that. So I look forward to following them and see how that goes. I mean, obviously with everything in web three, there is that like, regulatory oversight that is you know hasn't has come a little bit but is like mm. loosely undefined and um but uh, i think the main the main equation is like the one thing i always point to i guess is something called the howie test right, right. which is you know what what is, is are the parameters to consider something an investment or not and it's obviously do your do your own research number one make sure you have someone who's an expert in the regulatory side the legal side of the right. fence um, because when we do think, when we do things in the DAO space, we want to do them right. Um, and, uh, you know, so the community, you know, gets elevated and, and grows and all of that. I see. So hopefully we kind of spike the interest of uh, uh, some uh, members of the audience here on, on exploring this idea, but what are the steps they need to, to make it touch a little bit on a syndicate, which is a platform. Are there any kind of uh, you know, WordPress <laughs> DAO for dummies, so you can actually create this uh, easily. Yeah, so Syndicate, one of their, um, you know, you basically can, you know, 
create a DAO almost instantly on their uh -huh. protocol. Right. There are other DAO tooling um, companies. DAO House is another great one. Mm -hmm. DAO House is based on um, uh, Moloch code, which, uh, which has an interesting parameter from a voting perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, what you can do, the way their voting mechanism works is um, there's a voting period. So you right. can, you vote on, vote on the proposal. I think it's like seven days or whatever it is. And there's mm -hmm. also like a, a grace period after that where you can kind of decide, well, I don't really like the way the direction <laughs> of this is going. Um, say the majority is not on your side. There's a function built into that code that's, that's called rage quit. It sounds mm. kind of like a little aggressive, but it's yeah. an interesting mechanic that they pulled in place that you can basically opt out and kind of, you know, take your ball and go home, so to speak. I see. Um, but but Dow House is a great one. Aragon has a bunch of great Dow tooling, right. whether it's treasury um, management. Uh, there, you know, when things get really interesting is when companies start springing up to make it easier to yeah. create the technology <laughs> that everyone's talking about. So yeah, there's a ton out on the on the Dow stuff. Yeah, it's almost like the postcard postcard publishing platforms that uh, or the social publishing of their day. Yeah. It, Let's wear the, the kind of the marketing hat for a second. You know, obviously marketers are interested in driving, you know, awareness at the top of the funnel and they want to retain a customer longer at the end of the funnel, you know, at the loyalty advocacy stage. So where do you see, you know, DAO fits into this funnel idea? I mean, do you see DAOs that are really supporting uh, prospects or at the awareness stage? Do you see them in the decision in the middle, the funnel, or it's practically, you know, once they're, you already kind of become a happy customer uh, at the advocate stage? That's a really interesting question and something I haven't really thought about, but I can definitely, definitely riff on it a little bit with you. Mm. I think to me, the, the thing that jumps out from a brand perspective is in their community that mm -hmm. is largely bought in. Right. right. They're, they're, they're wearing the t-shirt. They've got the sticker on the car. Yeah. Like the fans, you know, they tell yeah. the, the fans, they tell their buddies about it. Right. Um, and then kind of trying to galvanize that community a bit and turning it into um, so where the mission behind something like that, you know, so every brand has got some sort of uh, social good component these days, which I think right. is great. Most do. Yeah. Um, the DAO could be an interesting way to resource the mm. social good cause, right? So nice. let's say a particular brand has a particular cause and the, the brand advocates who are already fans of the brand have their superpowers and can come together and be an amplifier of the brand's work in that cause. Nice. And then are in turn rewarded with some kind of some kind of mechanism that uh, turns into, you know, it's like almost like an artist colony, right? An artist colony in that uh, you know remote uh, location, working artist on projects colony, together. Guilds, yeah, guilds. Yeah. They talk about a lot exactly. in the DAO space. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Wow. Yeah, and, and and knowing you know the corporate world, you know, with legalese that needs to prove everything. I'm coming, you know, for working for IBM, Nokia. I know how it's mm -hmm. like. <laughs> Yep. How do you see that environment, you know, responding to DAO when, you know, pretty much there, there are no rails? I mean, you said the rails at the onset, but then on it's off to the races. I think, I think for brands to really dive into some of this stuff, I mean, if we just pull, pull it back a little bit to Web3 yeah. and don't just talk about DAOs, if we talk about NFTs, if we talk right. about metaverse executions and partnerships and all of that, I think as we start seeing brands hire mm -hmm. um a chief metaverse officer for lack of a better right. term that can help them navigate all of that stuff and teach right because the first thing that, that i've been pulled into a lot of different brands is teaching people what this technology what this what this capability can do yeah um how to harness that capability and then also look at the marketing strategy look at the audience right yep. so you have the marketing strategy you have the audience where is your audience Yep. And if you look at three different populations, you have one, they're maybe web three savvy. They have a wallet. They've done some stuff. Right. There's one in the middle that's like web three curious. Hey, all this stuff sounds cool, but I haven't done anything. Yep. And then you have web three averse yep. on the other side where they're like, this stuff sounds crazy. I'm not messing with it. 
Right. So starting to help brands figure out where their audience is and how to get their audience onboarded into what they're trying to do and do it in a tangible way. So some of the outputs of some of these discussions, like every most really successful Web3 projects, whether they're a DAO or, mm -hmm. a, or an NFT auction or a or play to earn game, have something called a white paper, right? Some of them are more technical. Some of them are more philosophical. But what if yeah. why, why couldn't a brand have a, a Web3 white paper that is this documented definition of what Web3 is, how they want to extend their current mission with it, and how they want to pull their community in closer to be able to hand to partners and talk to you I know uh, potential, right? So I think those are some of the conversations I've been having with with brands, but it starts with education and then moves into how do we align that education with what they're currently doing and how can we use this capability to extend their mission, right? I see. So, so it makes sense, you know, you, you don't say just focus on the DAO as a standalone a activity, really, you know, zoom out and, and see how it fits a, an overall Web3 strategy, a metaverse strategy where Maybe there's NFT component. Maybe there is a, how your audience makes sense to respond to it. How your brand? Do you have a, you know intellectual property that you can actually mobilize and tokenize? So there's a lot of questions that you got to do. And you said you know you first start with education because it's so new to everybody, <laughs> and lots of questions. And speaking about well, questions, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, th thinking even bigger, like I, if we look like five years down the road, I, I'm I'm a big believer in mm -hmm. DAOs are going to be the large way, uh, one of the larger methods of organizing, you know, businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have instead of these companies and companies aren't going to go away and the ways companies right. organize is not going to go away, but there's going to be a new version of that that is going to be maybe on the startup right? side, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. And then you have these individuals. I, I talked to a buddy a long time ago and in order, and he said, in order to participate in Web3, you have to be something in Web3. So there's this whole idea of self-sovereign identity right. that is essentially you're, you're encapsulated, right? With these different permissions and interactive, you know, directives, yep. right? And these individuals move in and out of these DAOs based on mm. projects. I mean, the freelance community is huge right now, right. that I think it's going to kind of move in that direction as well. Yeah, and it's definitely going to democratize and kind of leave the all the legalese because it's going to be all part of smart contracts. So it's easier to interact. And and the good part about the tokens is really that not only you get compensated, but the more you add value, your token is increasing in value. And there's you know the secondary market, a resale, all these opportunities available to you as well. So that's another difference uh, from just a, you know, I call it like, a, <laughs> you know, a share community, <laughs> I mean, a, like a stock market a share community where people just uh, have X number of stocks and that's represent their power of uh, decision-making. Yeah. Well, think about, think about within brands, right? There's, there are these are uh, within companies themselves, right? There are innovation departments, yep. right? And even back in the day, you had like Lockheed Martin and Skunk Works, and there was right. this whole different rule set and, yeah. you know, different mode of operations. You know, what if, what if the innovation teams were started to, to be these DAO organizations where, you know, you would submit an idea mm -hmm. in that organization encapsulated as an nft with its details with its ownership with what you want to see done with that right and then i grab that lego block that nft i go that's a great idea what if you added x y or z and then my stuff is automatically added on top and then added on top and this this idea of co-creation yeah. could yeah. be co-creation it could be great because you're going to feel comfortable with sharing your idea right because the ownership is encapsulated right so i mean i think innovation could be really interesting in companies using this mode yeah so as you speak to brands uh, and their interest, uh, what are the typical questions they have or misconceptions about this whole space? I think it's it's all over the it's all over the uh, spectrum on that. You mm -hmm. know, one, you know, some some are you know automatically associating you know an NFT with Bitcoin, 
like <laughs> NFT and Bitcoin being synonymous, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and to tell you the truth, I mean, I've spent so much time in this space that I've educated myself and that's what you kind of have to do. And you got to do that yeah. and all mm -hmm. of that. But, you know, there are some folks in, in that realm, but there are other folks that are highly technical mm -hmm. um, and, and understand blockchain as a foundation that, that they can see it click a little bit more. Like, mm. um, think about music artists. Um, right. You know, Dead Mouse is a music artist, right? He mm -hmm. is highly technical, right? Yep. And Joel is highly technical in his understanding of computers, computes, software, all of that stuff. And when he first started in the space, if you think of an artist as a brand, right? Yep. If you have that knowledge of the tech, the ramp is easier, right? But if you right. don't have that knowledge of tech in general, then you then you tend to be um, tend to be more more guard more guarded, I guess, with it. Yeah, yeah. Or no, or, or adopting it later, you know, taking a little bit longer with your decision. Right. And as you're following the market and seeing some successful DAOs, and we talked about different types already. Is there any sense of uh, what success criteria, criteria means or looks like? You know, is it uh, the value uh, the community was able to generate? Is it the membership size? What is it? That's that's interesting. I I, I love the idea of like creating frameworks to understand things and evaluate things. I I, yeah. I did one a while back that was uh, you know value creation in the metaverse, and it was like this six step. Yeah, I read that. It was awesome. Utility. I really enjoyed it. It's very well oh, thought out. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 fun because I I used it for myself to understand it all and I'm glad, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's helping other folks as well, but I think that the, the big thing to think about is you know, as far as what makes a community or what makes a DAO successful. Mm -hmm. I'll illustrate it with one I'm I've been um I've been participating in the Discord of which I think uh, gives you a good sense of where the community is going. And um, Open Meta DAO mm -hmm. uh, was started by, um, I think it was Ryan Gill out of a company called Crucible. Crucible has this self-sovereign identity mechanic uh, that they're putting out. But yep. he, Ryan at the, at the onset has had this strong conviction that the metaverse is going to be open. It's not going to mm. be another version of a walled garden where it's right. Web2 platforms. And that culture... Just him saying all of this stuff on the front end and me reading what he was writing and putting out, me reading his white paper, mm -hmm. that pulled me into the Discord, right? So That's I got in the Discord and then I started interacting with all of these different groups. I'm sharing my ideas. They're sharing their ideas. And it's like it's like you're instantly in a community that authentically yeah. cares about you know helping you, helping elevate your ideas. You help mm -hmm. elevate others. Um, not all DAOs are like that. Not all, yeah. <laughs> not all communities are like that. Ryan has done a tremendous job building that community. But I think that's one of the biggest metrics is because I haven't even gotten into the, I haven't voted on anything. I haven't done any of that stuff. All I'm doing is participating in the community because he's growing his community. This is the on-ramp. He's right. building and growing and activating the community. And then he's going to add the components as it comes. I see. But but I think that's, it. it, it, goes, it goes back to community. Like, is it, is it a place you want to hang out? Is it a place where you feel comfortable bringing your ideas? Uh, are you able to use your superpowers to help somebody else? Yeah. Um, those are the things that I think about with that. I, it's funny. I don't think about the financial aspects of it. At yeah, this no, I'm point, kind of which, wondering. Which maybe good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like anything, you know, in business, everybody looking for the KPIs. What should I look for? What I should measure? <laughs> yep. So, so this is another kind of a related question. So, so in terms of, uh, you know, the process that you work with brands, do you have any kind of uh, specific steps you go through? I do. I do. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of conversations, mm -hmm. um, you know, norm, I mean, from, from, you know, the education piece to, yeah. Hey, let's budget a few things and test some things and try it. I mean, it's a, it's a four to six month kind of ramp, right. but, but it's fun for me to bring, my superpower to the table for them since I've been involved with this. They know their brand. They know what they want to do. Their superpower is this encapsulated uh, ethereal extension of a company, right? Yeah. So coming in and educating and say, well, guys, here's what Web3 is to me. Uh, here are what some industry leaders are talking about Web3. Here are the building blocks. Here's how it works. Mm -hmm. Not getting too tech related. Let's talk right. about it as a capability. I'm not pulling up code and smart contract yeah. language. I'm saying, hey, what if you could what if you can encapsulate your brand 
as an NFT, right? And mm -hmm. what does that look like as creating a multitude of assets? Just think visually, right? I what see. if you're able to, to create NFTs of your brand and then in turn license that, right? Where other creators mm -hmm. could come and pull that NFT as an encapsulation of your brand to kind of come in and out. So we, we educate, then we start learning more about the strategy, what they're trying to do. Is it a, is it a move for audience? Are mm -hmm. they trying to grow audience and reach? Are they trying to get deeper with a current audience? Are they, uh, is this a revenue generating situation, right? So I then see. you start figuring those things out. And then step by step, you, we start getting to an understanding. And then we start looking at, well, hey, let's look at your, let's look at your tent poles for the year. What are you doing? And how mm. can we use Web3 authentically, not force it, not do it because right. everyone else does it. Because exactly. I always advocate, don't get out there and do it just because everyone else is doing it. Spend your time with sure. someone who knows this stuff, yep. someone who's willing to understand your brand and then help you drive a path forward. That makes sense. And typically you work with the marketing department or there are other teams in our organization that are paying an interest in this. Uh, you know, the entry point's been a little different. Sometimes it's, you know, at the CMO level, sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's at other areas of the C-suite that have been right. exploring, uh, you know, exploring this, mm -hmm. this whole thing. A lot of companies that are uh, in charge of reward programs oh, or in charge yeah. of um, community activation, loyalty. Are really interested in yep. that stuff, loyalty mm -hmm. programs, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of times it's on, a lot of times it's on the brand side because they're seeing mm. this as an opportunity to build to, brand. Uh, yeah. To pull in a tool set. It's a new capability in a tool set. Yeah. That makes sense. Wow. This is so exciting. So much stuff. And, you know, my, my head is kind of spinning, you know, with the possibilities, but to let, uh, you know, our audience kind of leave with this, something uh, concrete. If somebody is interested to explore this, uh, you know, DAO as part of a larger metaverse strategy, what would you say would be your three top three tips? That's a great question. It's a great question. Um, I would say, uh, you know, obviously dig in and, and do some research on your own. It's, it's very noisy and it's very tough to, to know where to go for exactly. the real stuff. Yeah. Um, one of the things that clicked for me early on, like a year and change ago, was um, there's a gentleman named Matthew Ball who wrote something called the Metaverse Primer that is an eight-part series of, you know, mm -hmm. kind of what this thing is, right? right? Yeah. So uh, he's been really great. Um, he was a good resource for me early on to kind of uh, get a little bit, a few levels deeper and deeper into it. Um, yep. I think that's a good one. Another great one is a, a friend of mine, Kathy Hackle. Yeah, who is um, she's a good friend. Very, yeah, <laughs> she was on oh, this yeah. show a couple of years ago, by the way. <laughs> yep, yep. So I've I've known Kathy for a while. We've yep. um we actually that that value creation framework we actually did together for Forbes. Oh, nice. And um, you know, obviously she's got great experience uh in, yeah. in helping brands navigate. I think it's find the trusted resources, mm -hmm. and uh, I think folks like myself and and I'm sure I can speak for Kathy as well are more than willing and excited to 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 start. Mm -hmm. from level one and, and start teaching and, and exploring together. It's, it's fun. It's fun right. to help people translate this stuff. Right. So it, it sounds like it's education and, and really not being afraid to kind of reach out to trusted advisors and really start to exploring really what to, it makes sense for your brand. Maybe it's a match, maybe not now, maybe, you know, in the future, but it's a good way for you to maybe kind of uh, label it in your experimental bucket <laughs> and, and and check it out and see if it will make sense uh, for your strategy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I would add to that, I think, is is you also should find a low risk way mm -hmm. to start playing around in it, not as a right. company. But if, if you were the chief marketing officer for brand yep. XYZ, right. you know, Shlomi does this, not the CMO, right? Yep. So I would say, hey, go get a MetaMask wallet or call me. I'll help right. you set one up yep. and you know, put just a tiny bit of, I mean, a couple hundred bucks yep. in there and then try some transactions, do some very low risk stuff. Because yep. you know, it's amazing once you get into something and you're actually doing it, you're like, whoa, I just minted an NFT. Like, holy cow. And there it is. Yep. And all of this stuff. And you get in the discords and you get in stuff. You have to tiptoe in it as an individual and then come back to your organization and, and bring some of that knowledge base. So true. I mean, that's exactly what I've done, you know, <laughs> experimenting on NFT, starting my gallery, 
on OpenSea and writing an article about, you know, uh, steps and what does it mean? So you're absolutely right. You know, playing around is the best way to kind of get your feet wet and, you know, get the, the experience. And have, so, a, have a trusted friend, like walk you through it too, because, sure. you know, there are, there are certain situations where, you know, obviously, you know, if you have a MetaMask wallet and you don't know not to share your seed phrase, like yeah, there could exactly. be some, some bad repercussions on some of this stuff. So bring a buddy, find a buddy, have yeah. them walk you through it and then do, do a little safe tiptoe. And then before you know it, you'll be hooked like me. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. This was fantastic. And for anyone that say would like to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, probably the best way is just to find me on social media. It's just Jeremy Gilby. Um, Twitter, you know, yep. is probably the best. You can find me on LinkedIn, Jeremy Gilbertson. Uh, drop me a note, drop me a question. Happy to explore some stuff with you. And Shlomi, this was great, man. What a fun awesome. conversation. So yep. grateful for you to have me on the uh, on the show yeah. and uh, hope to connect great. soon. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much again. And for all of you listening or watching, you know, we'll see you in this next episode of Visual Storytelling today. Thank you.